This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You are going to hear a talk about making the most of graduate school. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Good afternoon. Welcome to you, new entrants to the graduate school. My job now is to give you the graduate school survival guide and make some concise suggestions for getting the most out of your relationship with our research supervisor, getting the most out of what you read, and making continual progress with your research. First, your relationship with your supervisor. This is fundamental. Meet regularly. You should expect to meet once a week or at least every other week because this will give you the motivation to make progress and also keeps your advisor aware of your work. Prepare for your meetings. Come to each meeting. Also, bring the notes from your previous meeting together with a list of any upcoming deadlines. Make a plan for what you hope to get out of each meeting. After the meeting, email your supervisor a brief summary. Include a list of major topics discussed, a list of what you agreed on, a note of any advice you may not want to follow, and a new summary of what you are planning to do. This helps avoid misunderstandings and provides a handy record of the progress of your research. Add a to do list for yourself and your supervisor. Including a reading list. Finally, add the time and date for the next meeting. My second main piece of advice is to keep your supervisor informed. Show him or her the results of your work as soon as possible. This helps your supervisor understand your research and identify any potential points of conflict early in the process. Include summaries of your work. Including any results of experiments, and also anything you write about your research. Thirdly, communicate clearly. If you disagree with your advisor, state your objections and concerns clearly and calmly. If you feel that something about your relationship is not working, discuss it with him or her. Whenever possible, suggest steps that they could take to address your concerns. Under this heading, it is extremely important to take the initiative. You do not need to clear everything you do in your research with your advisor. He or she is busy too. You must be responsible for your own ideas and the progress of your work. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. The second section of my talk is about getting the most out of what you read. The first principle here is to be organized. Keep an electronic bibliography with notes and pointers to the paper files. Keep and file all the papers you have read. Point 2. Be efficient. Only read what you need to. 
Start by reading only the conclusion, scanning figures and tables, and looking at their references. Read the other sections only if the paper seems relevant or you think it might help you get a different perspective. Skip the sections you think you already understand. These are often the background and motivation sections. It's of critical importance to take good notes on every paper you find worth reading. Note especially what problem the author is trying to solve, what approach they take to the problem, and how their approach differs from other approaches. Next, summarize what you have read on each topic. After you have read several papers on the same topic, note the key problems, the various formulations of the problem under consideration, the relationship between the various approaches and the alternative approaches you come across. Let me add one point you might not have already thought of. Read PhD theses. Even though they are long, they can be very helpful for quickly learning about what has been done in your field of interest. Focus particularly on the background sections and method sections. Don't forget to read your advisor's thesis. This will give you an idea of what he or she expects from you. The third section of my talk is about making continual progress with your research. Keep a journal of your ideas. Write down every issue you are thinking about, even if you think it is stupid. This will help you keep track of your progress and keep you from going round in circles. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. The Student Union is having a meeting to discuss how to help the community. As you listen, complete the summary by writing no more than two words on each line. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. May I have your attention, please? We're going to start the meeting now. I'm very pleased to see so many people here. You obviously all know that the purpose of this meeting is to discuss how to help the community. Next month, the National Union of Students are running a National Community Week. They've asked us to cooperate in any way we can. The idea is that all students should give up some of their time to help the community. Surely that's what we do in Rag Week. Does that mean we're going to do this sort of thing twice a year? No, not really. The scheme is nationwide. It has two aims. To show the public that students are responsible members of society and to show students ways in which they can give really practical help to the community. The National Union of Students haven't made any suggestions. They want the students in each area to work out their own schemes. And really, that's the purpose of this meeting, to think up some ideas about the sort of help we can give. Let's discuss now. Any suggestions? It is Saturday morning. A group of students are going to help an old man in the community. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Where is Milkman Street? Is it far? 
No, I don't think so. It's somewhere near. Oh, look there. It's just around the corner. What's the number again? Number eight, Mr. Tyler, eight Moulton Street. Careful with those tins of paint. I'll knock. The welfare office said that they'd written to him to tell him we were coming. The curtains are all drawn. It doesn't look as if anyone's at home. He's probably watching TV. He's a long time coming. He'll be pleased to see us, I'm sure. Go away. I don't want any. Hello, Mr. Tyler. Is it Mr. Tyler? Isn't it? We're the student volunteers. Engineers? I don't want any engineers. I've got a gas fire. No, Mr. Tyler. We've come to do your decorating. No, thank you. Not today. Perhaps you could open the door, Mr. Tyler. We've come to paint your kitchen. Well, why didn't you say so? We can come again tomorrow if it's inconvenient now. No, no, no. It's all right. Don't stay there at the front. Come round the back. I never use the front door. Only the back. Who is it? Is the student volunteer? Hello. You're the student volunteer, aren't you? Yes. Good afternoon. The welfare office told me to come here. My name is Diana. Yes, they wrote to me about this. Come in, please. There, isn't that nice and comfy? That's lovely, dear. And warm too. It's really cosy in here. I wish I could get about a bit more, like you young people. I could go out and see my son and my grandchildren. They live in Edinburgh, you know. I don't see them often. My son has got a lot of work. I used to go out to work. That was after my husband died. Never worked when I was married, though. No. No, never. He used to say a woman's place is in the home. Yes, life's like that. I'll just dust these photos. That's him, the one in the middle of the front row. His moustache was lovely. That was taken when he was in the army. He looks very smart. Yes, he was. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. Well, there we are. I want you to read a book to me. You know my eyes are not very good now. Where is the book? It's on my desk. It is Little Dorrit by Dickens. You know the bit I like? It's on page two hundred and one. It describes Little Dorrit's love for her father. Ah, yes. Here, she never left him. Nice and comfortable. Here, put this shawl around your shoulders. My husband used to read this book to me. She never left him all that night. As if she had done him a wrong which her tenderness could hardly repair, she sat by him in his sleep, at times softly kissing him. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. A student wants to register for a conference. Listen to the conversation between the student and the woman, and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes. Is this where we register for the Beyond Two Thousand conference? Yes. What's your name, and I'll get your conference bag. Well, I haven't actually registered yet. I was told I'd be able to register today, so I hope that's okay. I've just arrived in Melbourne. That should be fine if you're a student. I'll need to take your details though. So, can I have your full name? Yes, sure. It's Melanie Mitchell. Is that M I T C H E L L? Yes, that's right. And that's Ms, not Miss. Okay, fair enough. And what's your address, Melanie? I live in student accommodation at Sydney University, so my address there is. 
Room 66, Women's College, Newtown. OK. And which faculty are you studying in? I'm in the Faculty of Education. I'm doing a Master's in Primary School Teaching. Right. And may I see your student card because I need to verify that you're a current student? Yes, sure. Here it is. My number is 994-578-ED. The woman asks the student some more questions about the conference. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. OK. Now, do you want to attend all three days? The conference runs from Thursday to Saturday. Yes, I think so, if I can afford it. What does it cost? Well, you're eligible for a student discount, which makes it $15 for a day registration or $40 for the three days, though it is possible to register for half a day only. I'll register for all three days, please. Good. Now, will you be requiring accommodation while you're here in Melbourne? Yes, I suppose I will. What's available? Well, we have several levels of accommodation. You can share a room with another student for $25 a night. Hmm. Or you can have your own room but share the bathroom. I believe it's just down the corridor. That's $45. Right. Or you can have a single room with your own bathroom. I don't mind sharing a room. On second thoughts, yes, I do. I'll have my own room, but I'll share the bathroom. Right. Now, the conference fee does not include meals, though you do get tea and coffee in the breaks. Shall I put you down for lunch? That's an extra $10 a day. And there's the conference dinner on Friday night, which is $25. Oh, and what about breakfast? <laughs> Hang on a minute. It's all starting to sound rather expensive. Um, I'll have the lunch, but not the dinner or breakfast, if that's OK. Perfectly OK. Now, a couple of other things. There are a number of special interest groups organised. They're known as SIGs, and you're asked to nominate your preference. They'll take place on the Friday afternoon and Saturday morning, but they're filling up quickly, which is why you need to nominate now. Right. What are the SIGs? Well, there are six altogether. Let's see. On Friday, you have a choice between computers in education or teaching reading skills. Hmm? Or a session on catering for the gifted child. Oh, they all sound interesting. But technology in the classroom is really my area of interest, rather than reading. So I'll go for that. I can probably read up on the gifted child topic myself. Right. And then the Saturday options are a session on cultural differences or there's music in the primary curriculum or you could go to the one on gender issues in the classroom. Wow! Can I go to them all? They all sound fascinating. Afraid not. Well, I'm really interested in how boys and girls behave differently, even when they are very young, so I'd better opt for the third session – even though the cultural differences sig is probably really interesting too. Right. And the music option would be interesting. And how would you like to pay? We accept most credit cards or bank checks, but not personal checks, I'm afraid. Been caught out too often before. And cash, of course. We never say no to cash. I'll have to put it on my card because I don't have enough cash on me right now. That's fine. Enjoy your time here with us in Melbourne. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Now turns to part 4. Part 4. You'll hear a lecturer talking about the International English Language Teaching System, IELTS. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Remember to write no more than two words or a number for each answer. Hello everyone. Now, the International English Language Testing System exam, or IELTS as it's better known, is one of the most successful and popular English language exams in the world today. What we're going to look at now is the history of IELTS and how it came to be so successful. The story starts back in the 1960s when the British Council created an exam called EPTB to test international applicants wanting to study at universities and colleges in the UK. EPTB, by the way, stood for English Proficiency Test Battery. Strange name, I know. This exam mainly used multiple choice questions and by the end of the 1970s was considered a little old-fashioned. So, in 1980, it was replaced by ELTS, the English Language Testing Service. This new exam was much more modern in approach. It was much more communicative, for example, and was intended to reflect how language was used in the real world, particularly in the academic context of universities and colleges. However, during the 1980s, the number of candidates taking the test was quite low. For example, only 4,000 people took the test in 1981. It's true that this had risen to 10,000 by 1985, but if you compare that to the number of candidates who take IELTS each year these days, more than a million, you can see why they considered it to be quite small. There were also some practical problems with the test. So, in 1987, it was decided to conduct a review, leading to a revised version of the exam. This was introduced in 1989, under its new name, IELTS. Over the next few years, the number of candidates increased rapidly. In 1995, there were over 43,000 candidates, and it was possible to take the test in any one of 210 test centres around the world. 1995 was also the year of the next revision to the exam, which simplified the reading module and also improved exam administration. Further minor changes followed. The speaking module was altered in 2001 and the criteria for marking the writing tasks were revised in 2005. In the same year, a computerised version of the exam was offered at certain test centres. 2003 was a milestone for IELTS as it was the year when the number of candidates went over half a million for the first time. There's no doubt that today, with as we said, a candidature more than double what it was back in 2003, IELTS is a major player in the highly competitive industry of English language examinations. That is the end of part four.